This episode is brought to you by Indie Film Hustle Academy, where filmmakers and screenwriters go to learn from top Hollywood industry professionals. Learn more at ifhacademy.com. I'd like to welcome to the show Michael D. Ratner. How you doing, Michael? How are you? I'm good, man. I'm good. How's uh, how's life treating you in this weird, wacky world that we live in? <laughs> Making it through. Weird and wacky. Uh, weird, weird and wacky is to say. Oh God! And you're you're doing productions left and right, and I'm assuming you never know what's going to happen if someone gets positive or not. It's just such a weird world, man. We're living in. Yeah, it's. Bec- I don't remember. Uh shooting prior to this um you know i I, I gotta say though it's been it's been great we have managed to stay shooting the entire time that's amazing we 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 pivoted early we we did uh we do this show with kevin hart called cold as balls and that was Mm -hmm. the first virtual shoot we did like the second week into covid in 2020 Mm -hmm. and then we quickly went right into dancing with the devil and we've Mm -hmm. been nonstop. but testing is now like in the dna of what you do in a day for a film shoot so it's pretty wild and masks everywhere like before you know michael jackson looked like a weirdo but now not so much <laughs> no it's it, it's it's it, that that is not something it's a, it's an accessory that's totally cut it's like a watch it's it, i mean is there going to be a time we're not going to wear it like i can't even i can't even walk out the door now without wearing one it just freaks me out if i don't have one on it's crazy <laughs> yeah. yeah so let's uh, so how did you get started in this insane business that we call the film industry so i good question um you know, and, and sort of uh, one of those answers that I feel like when other people say it, I roll my eyes, but it's the truth. I don't remember a time when I didn't want to do this. You know, I remember um, being super young and my my father had a – actually, I keep it here. I could turn the camera and show you. Yeah. It's, it's in my stack of stuff. I have a VHS camera that was my oh, father's yeah. Yeah. and I taught myself how to use it. And um, – you know, I would run around the house and I would shoot everything. And I remember my mom would be like in a robe in the morning. She'd be like, why are you shooting me? You know, and I just would like run around <laughs> like a madman. And I would, I like, I liked, you know, my brother and I liked the WWE at the time. And oh. we would read matches and, you oh, yeah. know, I would film it and create storylines. And, um, and then I taught myself how to edit. And I, you know, it was, it was really interesting. And, and um, it was a time when you could teach yourself how to do things. And, mm-hmm. You know, when I went to high school, I remember teachers, uh, you know, the one specific one I remember, it was Catcher in the Rye, and we were supposed to do an uh, essay on it, and I asked the, the teacher, her name was, uh, I think it was Mrs., yeah, it was, it was Mrs. Clapper, she, uh, she, she, I, I said, you know, I, I'd like to make a, 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 a film about this rather than a paper. And she said, you just want to mess around with your friends and shoot something. And I said, no, I said, actually, I think I could do something that speaks even more powerfully than a, an essay. And she said, um, no. And I said, well, what if I do that? Plus I write the essay. Will you show it in class? And she said yes to that. Cause it was even more work. And I remember the feeling I had when people watched that and it worked, mm-hmm. I, I knew that's what I wanted to do with my life. Yeah, I, I I had a similar experience with a. I had a high A camera that my grandpa gave me, and I used to run around. I used to, and I did the same thing. A teacher, business law teacher, is like, "Hey, can I shoot a, you know, this this promo?" And she's yeah. like, "Sure." And the whole class. I mean, it was standing room only because it was. I was in the '90s, like early '90s, so it was still someone shooting something was like, "What?" Yeah. <laughs> now it's like everybody shoots, but yeah, I think it wasn't. I don't remember other kids running around doing it the way, like in high school at least. And you know, I, right. I was in I, I was in Hebrew school shooting stuff, and I would have my friends come over, and I'd you know we we I'd put them in costumes and stuff, and mm-hmm. I just loved it. I loved that feeling when I knew I had something that was going to make people laugh, and I was waiting and and in the you know auditorium or in the classroom, and it was such a high, and it was entertaining people and having something to say and and getting your personality out there. Um, And I just thought, I I, I guess back then I didn't really realize like, oh, I want to make it a business and I want to make money doing it. It was more so just I loved it. And then, you know, you start to learn about life and realize that you can uh, really, really make this work and you start getting inspired by people. And next thing you know, here you are. Now, was there a film that kind of lit the fire? Was there like that one you like, oh, my God, I have to do this? You know, um, my answer is 
the the answer is I remember seeing early Adam Sandler movies. I remember seeing Happy um, Gilmore, Billy Madison. Gilmore. Yep, I remember seeing those movies and being like, "Wow, like <laughs> this is so fucking cool." Uh, can you curse on this? I don't, I, 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 it's an occasional f bomb is fine. <laughs> that'll be that'll be the only one. But it's, okay. that's how I felt at the time, right? And I was like, "This is amazing." And I, I wasn't so deep that I knew whether I wanted to be a producer, director, writer, mm-hmm. actor, comedian. Like it was just this is magic. This makes – this is so cool. And then I remember the first one that really – this is uh, uh, an interesting one to note because I was a bit older at this point. But I remember the one that actually spoke to me a bit because it was a, this coming-of-age story and I thought it had such heart was uh, Super Bad. I remember seeing yeah. Super Bad. Yeah. And I remember going, man, like this is such – this is – I know high school like this. And I know these stories. Um, so those are a couple films that I remember seeing. Um, and, and there's some other Judd Apatow films and stuff. But um, yeah, those are those are sort of when I was like, man, this is this is so incredible. You can make people laugh, and you could tell stories that have heart and are relatable. Um, and I, I do. I remember. I remember those moments. Was your first directing gigs in in music videos? So my first uh, directing, like. I mean, I can tell you the countless things that I directed that were just horrible yeah. and that nobody's ever seen because there's there's thousands, right? Mm-hmm. And I would like, and I, for so long I was ashamed of just how bad they were. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, but the first thing I directed that I felt was was solid was in in films. I went to UPenn undergrad, mm-hmm. um, and I majored in film and English. But I really was just learning about cinema. It was cinema studies. You weren't learning how to be a filmmaker per se. Mm-hmm. Then I went to NYU grad film school, and that's where I really learned how to be a filmmaker. And I think that program is so phenomenal. And I made a film there called The Thirty Year Old Briss, which was about an interfaith couple, um, <laughs> and it takes the night before the guy has to get circumcised. And um, that film got into Tribeca. It was, you know, I think a 10, 12 minute short film. And uh, that was the f- first thing I directed that started getting a little buzz. And, um, you know, then I got into some music videos and stuff from there. But it was really that film at Tish that was the first one that I was like, oh, I think this is, you know, this is working a bit. Now, you know, we, you know I've been directing for 20 odd years as well. And uh, there's always that day when you're on set that you feel like the entire world is going to come crashing down around you. You're losing the sun. The camera broke. The card isn't working. Someone deleted the last 30, three hours you shot. You know, some, something happens. Was Is there something that sticks out in your mind that happened on a day or in a project? And how did you overcome it as a director? Wow. It's like take your pick, right? Uh, <laughs> it's a daily basis, right? <laughs> yeah, I've had... Everything that you just said, because I mean, I started off as a scrappy filmmaker. Like I remember, you know, <laughs> you you become you don't take anything for granted. You know, I started OBB and I have this company now where every role is fulfilled and I show up and I'm the director and I'm able to just like do my thing and leave. Mm-hmm. But there is a certain um, you 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 don't soon forget the roles of everybody on your on on your set if you really did them all and i am so grateful for those brutal times that i tried to you know really be the best location set sound person that i could be and the right. times that i did hold the boom because you know i am you can't see my full body and physique here i'm not exactly um cut out for for that and that's brutal job. Oh, it's uh, brutal, and, and, brutal. And, and and understanding why you need to get room tone and understanding that somebody, if your call time is at 6 a.m., needs to go get the truck to get the uh, lights and that's at 3 a.m. and you know you do all of that and you know you have to you you you. you I remember PAing in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, you know, before I went to film school and I was in charge of going and driving this like broken down van from Pittsburgh <laughs> to to Johnstown. And I thought I was going to like die because the wheels were going to fall off. And, and, and those those experiences really make you a much, much better leader and director. And I'm very grateful that I had those experiences while in the moment you don't see it that way. So, yeah, there's countless examples of not really knowing that you should be backing up your drives. And it's like a whole day's work gets knocked out. And that's like, <sighs> you know, twist the knife. Um, so I, I have had all of that, um, but you make it work and you keep going and, you know, nothing's ever what 
it was supposed to be. Nothing's ever what was scripted. Nothing's ever what you had in your head, but it ends up being something special. So um, there's there's so many different examples. I mean, that Johnstown one, I, I haven't talked about that in probably 10 years. That was that was crazy because huh. I was the PA. I was so excited to shadow the director. I thought I was mm-hmm. going to be able to do that. And they're like, hey, there's a van four hours away. You need to go get it and then come back. You know, that was the whole day. Um, and I really, I, I remember it broke down. And, you know, I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get fired from this first pilot ever because i'm not gonna get this van here and you know it all works out oh dude i I was i was interning at uh at a show for fox at universal studios and the producer's like hey uh the producer wants to talk to you i'm like oh shoot like the the showrunner wants to talk to me and i go into his office like i like what you've been doing here kid Uh, i I have a special project for you i'm like well what is it he's like i need you to help me move (laughs) you know what you do that gives you a lot of time to then go and 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 find your moment to make an impression. Exactly. And exactly. You know what? Um, I pay so much attention to that. Who's who's who looks like they're just there to help and uh, be a positive influence and voice. And um, you know that that doesn't go unnoticed if you pick the pocket and you you play those situations right. And mm-hmm. um, I think that again, all the all of those experiences and. Um, doing all these different roles and Mm -hmm. before you, you know, you will be in charge and you will be making those choices. And if you really know what you're talking about versus if you don't, it becomes really clear and people want to work for people that they feel like have done it before. Right. No, no quite. Yeah. Man, a a season, a season crew can smell, can smell it uh, five minutes in if the directors knows what they're doing or not. Like, and they will roll you over depending on where you are in the in the world. L.A. crew, New York crew, they uh, even Atlanta crew. They're gonna oh, seasoned guys and gals. They will they run over you because they just don't have the patience for it. Um, and I, I've had the pleasure of talking to a lot of you know really amazing guests on my show. And one thing I've always wondered, I, I always ask. Uh, is about this thing that I can't believe some of these Oscar winners and Emmy winners and uh, the imposter syndrome. And it's a thing that, you know, I feel it. I mean, but writers feel it, everything. I was wondering if you've ever had to deal with that on, on your own, meaning like, see, sometimes I've, talk, I've talked to some guys who, you know, literally won Oscars. And I'm like, do you have it? Yeah, sometimes on my last movie that was $100 million. I felt like any moment now security was going to come in and go, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. Come on, get him out of here. Is it just an artist thing? Or do you do you, do you ever feel that? I mean, like an, a normal artist would. Um, and how do you deal with it if you do feel it? I try to spin that positively. Um, okay. I try to, and the answer is of course, um, because it, like another word for that is insecurity, right? Sure, it's right. Like just, and I try to think to myself in those moments, you know, hard work pays off and, you know, nobody knows what they're doing, but we're going to figure it out. And also just, I'm so happy I didn't have like early, early, early success. Amen. Uh, and, and, the, and the reason for that is it's always with you. And it's not like it took me forever. I feel very lucky that I, I that I'm that I am where I am right now at my age and, and it's not lost on me. But it didn't happen right away for me at all. And you get told no so frequently. It's almost like you just you need to be Teflon because every day you have an idea and people are like, oh, yeah, cool. Like, call me back in a couple weeks or like, no, just no. Right. And that then sucks. All of a sudden, yeah, that sucks. That's just <laughs> where you was that a joke? Um, yeah, you know, exactly. And, and you get deflated and then you get back up. And I think the people that make it in this business are like wildly resilient. Right. And I think that you you basically go and get to a point where um you remember those no's and people start all of a sudden saying yes and then eventually you're actually going to have to turn stuff down which is such a foreign concept when you're when you're starting your career and i think in those moments of frustration or you're not sure if you're if you belong and whatnot i try to just think back to well i must be doing something right i'm here right and those no's turned into yeses and i try my best not to get riddled with anxiety and frustration. I say try because I fail at this sometimes, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, And I try to just think, you dreamed of this. So let's just figure it out. Just go for it and not go and cave or or, or fold. You know, I got to say one of the, um, I mentioned before that Kevin Hart show that we do, Mm -hmm. it's about to enter season six. Uh, Kevin and, and I actually had a conversation 
very early on, we started working together. And I asked him, I said, shouldn't you be on a beach, like just sipping like a Mai Tai? Like, what are we doing here? Because he just like, he, this guy works harder than anybody. He's the consummate pro. And he did. He said to me, he said, I remember all those no's. He said, I'm still catching it. You think I'd say yes to a lot? I'm catching up for all the no's. Because he didn't make it right away. Oh, no, it took him and, and, a decade. And, it, and, it, and I, I related to it so much. So I don't know. I try to think more about that. You know, I don't. it doesn't exactly answer your question. But yeah, in those but moments of like, you know, do I belong or or am I like here? Like how did this – I just try to go like, yes, we are. And like we're going to figure it out. And we don't know everything because nobody does. And let's just – let's grind, you know. Um one funny story that really answers your question is I was once uh, – I really liked this film and thought I could make a difference um, in, in in a later stage. You know, I didn't know that you could come into a film that's already in the can and edit and help and make an impact like this early on in my career. And I was on this call that I never should have been on because I was super young and like trying to like show that – I had great ideas. So, you know, but I didn't know what I was doing. I'd never done it before. And I remember they asked me a, a simple question. Um and I, I said, uh, I think our connection's bad. Hold on. And I Googled it. I didn't know how to end. I didn't even know what they were talking about. <laughs> so That's amazing. I was, you know, yeah, and I Googled it fast. And I was like, oh, yeah, you know. And um, it, that, that's just the hustle. The hustle, you know. It, you, there you go. Your hat says that right now. You just figure <laughs> it out. And that doesn't mean be a BS artist. Far from it. But, like, hustle, ask questions, ask for help, and just roll with it. We're all in the same situation. You know, no, no question. Now, yeah, I was going to ask you about Kevin uh, Kevin Hart's cold balls, uh, which is I've seen, by the way, I've seen many episodes. I freaking I'm a huge Kevin Hart fan. Like, who isn't? I mean, who is it? What is it like working with? An, a, 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 I've heard the same thing from people that worked with him. Nothing but a professional. Wonderful to work with. Uh, just there on time, does his job, makes people laugh, and is just working hard. What is it like working with him? And is there something you've taken away from, you know, just working with a, a star of that caliber? I mean, he's he's a worldwide huge star, yeah, mega bankable movie star, comedian, yeah. multi hyphenate CEO, business owner. Yeah. yeah, Kevin and I have had many conversations. I mean, obviously, you know, I I. I own and, and run OBB, which is one hat. I direct. That's another hat. I produce it. And he's a guy with a lot of dashes. If you were to put, try to introduce him, right? Um, and what I'll say is he has it. And that might seem like an obvious <laughs> thing to say, but just there is something about he, – he's special. I mean the way his brain works, the way he reads a script and just knows it immediately, like he inside mm-hmm. out. Something about his brain is different. And he is gifted. What makes Kevin Hart Kevin Hart is there's that plus this crazy work ethic, plus this like, you know, charm and everything else. Uh, He's hilarious. But he has this um, intangible gift that, I mean, it's uh, someone should study his brain. He's got this crazy mind and memory and gift. And then you pair that with all the other checkboxes of things he has and you get Kevin Hart. Um, but yeah, I mean, you work with a guy like that and you're just in the presence of, you know, someone who's really, really great. Yeah. And, and, you know, I've had the pleasure of working with, with those kind of stars and you just know it when they walk in the room, there's just that thing that's intangible. It's there. It's like, oh yeah, that's why they're a huge movie star. I get it now. They don't have to say a word. You just go. Oh. Yeah, it goes beyond confidence or the way they carry no, themselves. It's, it's, it's something. It's, it's like this special aura. And, you know, I, I, I um, I work with a lot of really talented people and I think I have a um, real knack for getting great performances from people in scripted and unscripted in movies and TV and in and, and what, what have you. Right. Um, and I think that that skill set, I can navigate the medium, whether it's, by the way, an audio, we have an audio division. Like, I think I know how to go and communicate and get those things done. So I have a certain way of going about it. And, you know, with Kevin specifically, um, anytime that I go to do my normal course, he just requires so much less and, or, or, or none at all, you mm-hmm. know? And it's just like, and I'm always like, man, I'll see how this goes. And he nails it, nails it every time. So the prep work just does. And that's not to say that he's some guy that shows up and doesn't do prep. Whatever he's doing is working. And it's just like, go for it. 
and and it never disappoints. He never seems like he doesn't know what he's talking about. And he, he I'll always be ready to go with a note, and he'll just do it on his own. Um, it's it's amazing. It's amazing. Now you've you know, obviously you've directed a lot of music videos. Is there anything that you brought from your music video experience into documentary? Because you have made a, a handful of documentaries, pretty high profile ones at that. Yeah, um, I think that I like um, mixing the worlds. Like I think that music videos are so stylistic um you know you can stylize them so much and in a in a very um competitive world where there's so many docs right now making stylistic choices to make yours rise up and feel special and different is a great move like you know we were the opening night headliner uh film at uh south by southwest this year with dancing with the devil and uh with demi and the opening sequence um of it's a four-part piece um and the opening sequence basically plays like this like XR music video. And it's got all these little like riddled pieces of the story that are symbolic. And if you were to play that piece straight through, it actually tells a story. It's more music video than it is doc, but it's an opening sequence, right? I think I took that from sort of my um, music video brain. Um, And uh, I think that when making docs specifically music docs i like to um take parts of the uh creative and what makes those musicians so um so special and put that into the dna of the filmmaking in some capacity and sometimes then that sort of gets meld with more music video type motifs and um it's fun to sort of weave in and out of that now you know i've seen some of your docs and you you're able to get um, your subjects to open up to you uh, and be very, very vulnerable. What tips do you have for filmmakers listening to be able to do that? I mean, and you're doing it with some of the biggest, you know, stars in the world, uh, which I'm, I'm assuming is a whole other level of comfortable that you have to get in order to do that. But what what suggestions do you have for filmmakers out there? Forget about the cameras. Forget mm-hmm. about. Um, and I, I, what, what I mean by that is not forget that they're there. That's a very obvious statement. What I mean is whatever day you plan to shoot, you better be working on your relationship with that person in a very um, non-transactional way way earlier on. And that means forget that you're directing them. Forget that um, you're one day sitting down from a very genuine place. You need to care about that person. And you need to care about the story you're telling and the vulnerability that you're referring to is earned. It's not just happenstance. And that's a comfort level of many, many off the record conversations. Um, and, you know, you ultimately get to a point where you understand what's your North Star. You got to be on the same page with people, too. What are you trying to accomplish? And, you know, why should they trust you? And you need to go and, and, and have those hard and difficult conversations, depending on what the subject matter is. But I think whether it's light or whether it's super heavy, you need to have that relationship. And that takes time and energy and that stuff. There's no instant gratification with that. You know, you're, nobody's going to applaud you and be like, you're such a great director. This film is so great. And you're not even going to know yourself. You know, talk about being insecure. You're not going to know yourself if you're, if you're going to achieve what you're looking to collectively with that person. But just put in the time and um, and then, you know, ask those questions in a way that are more conversational. I think, you know, I've said this before publicly, but like there is this moment when I can tell um, that the interview has turned into a conversation. And the second that's happened, that's when you really start to um, speak in a way that's just so special. And and it all comes down to trust in your relationship and um you know, that just means you got to put the time in, like with all things. Yeah, it's funny. I've had I've had that experience with my guests sometimes where I, I'm talking to them and they forget that we're recording and they start asking like personal questions and like, hey, where do you live? And I, you know, maybe we could, I'm like, dude, dude, we're recording still. <laughs> and they're like, oh yeah, 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 I forgot, I forgot. You fall into that and that's the magic place. That really is yeah. a magic place. Yeah, and, 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 you know, there's also... You know, one could argue, well, if you're too close, you know exactly what they want. Are you going to be too subjective in what you're saying? You know, and the answer is no. You know, you can tell an objective story while understanding someone's heart and what they're after and why they're doing something. You know, one of the most interesting things with some of the uh, really, you know, large temple 
movies and projects that I've made as of late with big stars um, in the doc space specifically is, you know, it's really unique for that vulnerability and that um, window into these people's lives. Sometimes the good, the bad and the ugly for people to do that while they're in their prime. I think that's really unique to my work, right? right. It's, you've seen many people later on in life. Ah, I got nothing to lose. Here's what happened back in the day. You know, right, right. And it, like, cool. That's really cool. That is. But there's something really special about somebody who has everything to lose, who's in the middle of it, doesn't need to be doing that, talking about those things because they want to connect with their fans and relate and, you know, specifically to call out, you know, Demi Lovato and Justin Bieber, who both did that in our their respective projects. You know, Seasons of Dancing with the Devil, I think, are two prime examples of I am struggling and I am dealing with mental health issues and I'm dealing right. with trauma. And that's because I'm a human being. It has nothing to do with that. I'm a celebrity. Right. Um, that is so bold and that has nothing to do with me those are choices that they each made and i was there to help facilitate their vision um which was really special you know it's so funny because i think in the era that i grew up you know i mean i'm i'm a bit older than you but i mean i remember when michael jackson and madonna and and, and you know all those big stars of the 80s and 90s they they're put on these pedestals and they don't they're not shown as human yeah they're they're just they're just the things almost and they never showed vulnerability ever because that wasn't expected of them but in today's generation and today's artist it's almost expected like the billy eilishes of the world and they, they are expected to be vulnerable and to be authentic and not packaged because fans want authenticity people want authenticity they are not going to just oh you're pretty great there's a thousand other pretty people behind you what makes you special oh you can sing great there's a thousand other people who can sing really great too what makes you special and uh and your docs really kind of open up those doors to you know two of the largest stars in the world right now yeah totally yeah i think that that is the different different you know differentiator like i think that you know the ability to go and Sure, Instagram, you get like 15 second clips into people's lives. But I always say people have like their Instagram personality. It's not really Of course, that, right? yeah, 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 yeah. A certain way on there and it's quick and it's fast. But like that is access, right? We didn't used to get that access with a Michael Jackson or some of the artists you named. That didn't really, you know, obviously exist. But I still think these docs are, that makes it even harder, right? Because it's like, oh, well, you're getting a window in. So what makes the doc special? You know, we've already seen them inside their house or we've already gotten the unfiltered version. It's like, Kind of. That's still a bit of um, not to polished. Say people, it's polished or it's raw for a specific reason. Like it's you know it's it's raw, but like the, the what we try to do is really tell a story. And um, I don't believe that um, you need you need an hour and a half or two hours to tell a story. I don't believe that you need half an hour. I believe that story and duration and what's happening in content right now with all of the different options on distri distributor and you know. Um, uh, varying agnostic lengths of things is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, I also think that, you know, just quick hit, hitters on, on social is not the way to really get deep and, and, and learn about stuff. So um, I think that these, these music docs are a way to connect. And you know what? Even more so in a time when touring stopped, right? The world, back yeah. to what we started talking about, like you could not connect with fans. So what are you doing? What are you up to? And how can you go and, um, speak to speak to those people that normally would get to go and get maybe see you on the road or see performances or or, or shows that you're on because everybody had to like take a deep breath and settle down and stay in one place a bit. When you were doing um, Dancing with the Devil with Demi Lovato, the, you know I you know just at the beginning of the first episode, you know it's like six months before the overdose. So you started that process, and the overdose happened in the middle of it, right? So actually, interestingly enough, they were working on a doc. Um, it was a follow-up to Simply Complicated that I was not involved in. Mm -hmm. um, and then when the overdose unfortunately happened, they stopped entirely. Of course. And when they decided that they were ready to talk about that, I had recently, you know, months before put out Seasons. And that's what ultimately, I think, made Demi feel like, Ooh, you know, we could potentially tell this together because that tone and that level of um, 
authenticity and rawness was what I think they were looking to do. Cause I think that film would have been a different tone and style, obviously. <laughs> not. So it just called for a fresh restart and I came in then, but I was able to inherit some of that footage obviously from before. And that was one of the filmmaking challenges, how to go and take some of the older stuff and ultimately shoot new stuff. And, and, and that's how we started. Yeah. And it's, and it's, you're working with your subject as opposed to a documentarian who is, recording a subject but is disconnected meaning that they go off they edit and the subject has no say on how it looks where now you're i can't can only imagine how difficult that is you're also now hey we're going to show the deepest darkest parts that you want to show we're going to expose all of it um and that's what this movie needs for in order to do it and they're involved with you so that takes another level of of bravery on the artist standpoint uh totally that, and 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 it is it's it's unique and it's nuanced and it's political and you got to um ultimately navigate that and it causes some awkward viewing sessions right where you know it on the one hand i've poured my soul into the edit and getting the story out there and trying to achieve this but you know i'm sitting in a room watching some really dark moments of somebody's life with them and that's that's a very you know unique you know, no, imagine, you know, we all go through shit, every one of us. But mm-hmm. have you watched it on film? You know, you're, you, right, re, you right. Know, talking about it. And then, oh, can you send me archival footage from home videos? And can you connect me to your mother to send me videos of you as a kid? I mean, imagine sitting there <sighs> watching. That's the experience they go through. And um, you need to really uh, be prepared for the reactions that will yield and, you um, understanding again that it's for a specific purpose and you do it and you uh work with the person you know i've never put out on on the projects we're discussing here like those get seen and discussed before they come out with the artist of course Um, and and that does not mean that they're going well you know here's a list of things you can't say you know that i haven't had that experience because there's always a conversation at the beginning of let's make sure that i'm the right person for this and if I'm the right person, we need to tell a real story. We can't make a propaganda puff piece. Like I just said, not who that's not the type of storyteller I am. And I don't think that's the, um, what your you know fans deserve or ultimately what you want to do. And we've always had those difficult or just, I shouldn't even say those conversations aren't difficult. It's just very straightforward conversations. Um, and as such, I think it's resulted in these really special projects. Now, I mean, you've again, worked with Demi and, and Justin and, and, and you know, two of the biggest stars in the world at the moment. You know, being uh, being in the orbit of those kind of stars, especially close to those orbits, uh, I've had small moments of those as well, where you're just in the orbit and just like there's satellites around, there's planets running around, and they are the center of the universe. What is it like day in day out being with some of the biggest stars in the world and seeing what they go through? Because you're th- you're not just a satellite; you're like next to. Yeah. And you're capturing it. So that must be a very different experience. You must have a sympathy for them that most might not because you see what they go through. and Things are on camera and off. So what is it like just as a, as a human being next to uh, another human going through that experience? Great question. Um, and uh, the, the answer, <laughs> I've tried so hard uh, to, in my work, explain what that experience is like and you know being hard on myself i've never effectively done that because nothing can do it justice besides seeing it firsthand and i've tried i've tried to do the chaotic cuts of paparazzi and things happening and it's like no to really see the forethought that goes into just moving just getting up and going to do something because of how famous they are right it's that, that is like a second to second reality. Now, I've also been very careful um, to be mindful of nobody wants to hear the woe is me. I'm a celebrity in my life. You know, I can't move like <laughs> there's a lot of perks. Right. So it's tough, but that doesn't change the reality that like it's it's hard. There are parts that are really hard and human nature is not designed for fame and celebrity. 
Um, You're right. We're not designed to be told how great we are 24-7. We're not designed to not be able to go outside. <laughs> question, 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 uncomfortable question, uncomfortable question. So, yeah, it, it does make you uh, sympathetic or I should just say really understanding of all sides of it. Nothing simple. Um, and it makes you just sort of get it all. Also, it made me really understand that just just because you read something does not mean it's true oh, right, yeah. at all. Like, like, you know, and, you know, it, 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 there's, 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 um, people can say anything about anybody. And when you're really famous, people just say stuff and then, you know, but that, that words matter. Words have power news, you know, outlets, you would think that, oh, well, you know, it's a, they're, they're a news outlet. It's gotta be real. Like, no, it's, it doesn't. I've just seen a lot of stuff where I've been with people and then, you know, that there's an article saying they were somewhere else. I'm like, wait a second. Well, you know, and, and that you start like realizing just that's, that's a daily occurrence. And I think that while, um, stars who have been in the limelight for a long time, probably get a bit immune to it. It's still annoying. It's still frustrating. And it could cause you to act out of character at times. And, it's a really interesting um, peek behind the curtain as to what those people go through. And, um, you know, many of whom uh, really do a pretty damn good job. And sure, they slip here and there. But for the most part, I've been really impressed. And I have no idea how I would uh, handle uh, that sort right. of uh, level of, of celebrity and whatnot. That, that's why it's so interesting. That's why I asked you the questions, because you get the kind of – role play that almost uh you know like cosplay that if you will because you're right next to them it's not you doing it you could walk away at any second and no one's really going to stop you in the street for the most part right. uh maybe in la uh <laughs> but but generally speaking it is it is it's it's fascinating to me and, and so many people want to be rich and famous but they don't understand that there is a cost man there is a cost and look like you said no woe is me they looked for it yeah, I mean, uh, funny funny story. I was on the set. I was doing music videos in L.A. Uh, fifty what fifteen years ago, something like that. And I was invited to an Usher music video, and there was like this this young kid who's going to be in it. And I'm like, who's this young kid? He's like, oh, some kid named Justin Bieber. And I had no, he was nobody. Justin right. was nobody. He was 15. He's tripping over cables. He's just trying to dance. And I'm there. I'm just like, oh, cool. I get to see Usher. <laughs> Yep. Six months later, baby, baby hits. <laughs> and it, I was just like, what the hell? And so I have a different, I, I saw Justin when he was a kid. Like he was literally just 15. He was just, yep. but he was so, even at that moment when I saw him and I was on set with him, you could just see it. You were like, there's something there. I don't know what it is. And this is not the song. Because <laughs> I, I saw the music video. I'm like, no, this is not the one. Um but it was it was really interesting, and people do ask for this, but they have to be really careful what yeah, they get. I think also the question is you, you don't know what you're asking for until you get it, and you got it. Right? So it's like, <laughs> right. uh, this is it. Um, so yeah, I think again, it's just it's fascinating. Um, yeah, and like with all things, again, there's pros and cons. Yeah, exactly. Like you know. Uh, you know, bad day. Who knows? Who knows? Uh, yeah, who it, it is? It is a pros and cons. Now, tell me about your new film with Justin, uh, Our World. Yeah, uh, came out in October. Really exciting. It was fun. It was you know you do a heavy doc series like Seasons, and then you pivot and you make a really fun film. That's you know obviously <laughs> COVID is like looming over this thing, and people were going through really a rough time, and and unfortunately, of course, people were. Um, dying from COVID and everybody was in a weird spot with work and figuring out how to provide. And that's a character in this piece. But once we get to the stage, um, it's a celebration of like his music and it's a nostalgic walk, you know, down memory lane from baby to mm -hmm. now. And um, there's, it's really verte and gritty. I think it was really cool how Justin, um, was like a DP and shot himself in it and, and Haley. And, and, you know, that was really because of safety protocols. I couldn't be there all the time. Sure. Shot in unique style. And then, um, obviously we, 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 we juxtaposing that with 32 camera setup with drones and all the flashiness, <laughs> the night of the show on the top of the Beverly Hilton was pretty unique. Um, and I think it captured the spirit of that moment in time. And, uh, it was really, it was really awesome. I I enjoyed making a concert doc, you know, and that's really what it was. It was a concert heavy doc, and um, 
it's it was uh, it was a blast, and I think people really enjoyed it. And how I mean, how was it shooting during the COVID protocol, man? Like, I mean, it's on such a big. It was a pretty big production. I mean, t- yeah. dealing thirty two cameras. It's no joke. Uh, it was no, it's no. I'm like my 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 butt just puckered when you said thirty two cameras. I'm like, oh Jesus, how did? I mean, I'm assuming at some point you're just like, hopefully I'll get some footage off of those those sets of cameras because you're not seeing everything at all times, right? No. Well, it was just we were shooting the hell out of it, right? I mean, yeah. we we had drones in the sky. We had um cameras on balconies uh we had long lenses from certain areas uh you know we we were doubling the live stream cameras and then we had the ability to convert it to 4k which is obviously what ended up um on the amazon film and uh we then had a bunch of you know running gun shooters getting cool you know um dynamic shots in the pit and whatnot but it was really crazy shooting in covid because we had our bubble and there was daily testing. And if somebody went down, the whole show was at risk, obviously. Um, so you had to just be super, super careful. And uh, everything was incredibly thought through. And we, 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 you know, luckily pulled it off. But that what what made the um, gloom of COVID and everything going on and pulling off the show, a uh, very interesting storyline. Also, like we had to live that making it. It was not just <laughs> manufactured drama. It was like. <laughs> All right, everybody's negative. Okay, good, good. You know, um, and Nick Demora goes down with COVID as his creative director, and then Justin had to fully step up and lead the team, which you know was a good story point because part of this was about Justin really coming into his own and really leading every part of his life for the first sure. time. Really, I mean, he's fine. he's a grown man, you know, and uh, we all think you know we remember you hear Justin and you're like, well, baby, and you know, he's he's, he's grown a grown, up. He's a grown ass man with a family. <laughs> He's a grown he's a, he's a grown man with a wife and 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 you know leading many of the same people he's been with. He's incredibly loyal, which is really cool. You know, you go and one of the storylines that I thought was important to hit home, and he thought as well was like, you know, he's been with the same people for all those years. It's very rare to see in any field, but in music especially. Um, so it's it's a fun one. It's a really fun watch, and you know, uh, it, it's 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 enjo- it's just enjoyable to go and watch some good music and and you know you'll realize how many justin bieber if you're a fan of course you know but even if not you'll be like man he's one talented person there's a lot of songs that you don't even sometimes i don't even realize it's justin and you're like oh that is a justin bieber song oh yeah like it, he's or he guest starred on this or get you know you know guest popped yeah. on that and it's just he's it's hard to believe that he's been around for 15 odd years at this point in the game um and and still and still going and still being relative uh, uh, you know relative because relevant excuse me because a lot of those boy bands as we all know from the yeah. 90s and the early 2000s they're they're not yeah, relevant <laughs> he just put out a number one album he's about to go on like a sold out arena tour um so pretty impressive he's doing he's doing all right he's doing okay he's okay he's, he's okay right. now what's next for you man uh, working on another big documentary right now that I have not announced yet, but okay. we are into it and um, seven months into it. Um, hopefully it will come out end of this year, beginning of next. I'm producing another big um, doc that I have not announced yet. That oh, Sorry, this just went off. Um, that we are in pre-pro on, which is really exciting. And then uh, we have a uh, animated uh music show that's really exciting um that's with a network that we haven't announced yet that's, uh, so there's 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 a bunch of stuff um there's a there's there's some scripted tv shows then there's a couple of these doc films we're working on a um a whole bunch of stuff and then really exciting for us we're building our, our first uh studio here in la so we nice. have a yeah a big uh production facility where we're building out stuff so we'll be able to bring a lot of our productions in house uh, but it's been great. I mean, we 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 are going to be 48 people here at OBB by the end of year, which is just a That's huge, huge number. Man. That's um, huge. Yeah, it's been it's been exciting time. But you know, it, we have this audio business that does podcasts and audio projects. Um, you know, we have our film group. We have TV. There's a lot of stuff going on, and at the heart of it all is is stories and. We're very lucky that we're in a time when there are uh, there's such a need. Everybody needs content right now, and we're making stuff, and it's a it's a fun time to play because dollars are not just coming from financiers or distributors; it's coming from brands, it's coming from all of, all over the place. So we're we're working on um, in a number of different areas with a number of different partners and having a blast. 
Yeah, yeah. Kevin Kevin Hart's uh, Cold Balls is is by Old Spice. <laughs> That's that's exactly right, and and um, yeah, we're, we have see, there's another one. We got season six of that coming up that we'll be shooting, which is just I. No matter what size project or what I'm doing or what's going on, I find out how to carve out time to direct that show. It's just so fun. Um, <laughs> I can I, imagine. I, I have to like do these wonky schedules for like you know whatever big thing I'm working on because I'm like. I, I want to. That's such an example of the new TV modern win. You know, it's it's a twelve to fifteen minute like internet show that just blew up and gets millions of viewers with a brand sponsor, and that works, right? With a with an A plus bankable movie star, it's that's an example of just how our landscape has changed. And, right. And being a you know they shouldn't call it film school anymore. It's content school. You know, and 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 people should want to be content makers, not filmmakers. Like, and again, nothing wrong. I I'm a film. I love film, but. Um, I always think, you know, if 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 some of these iconic filmmakers um, from the past were starting today, they'd be using all of these different technologies and oh, distribute Spielberg, and yeah, Spielberg, all those guys, tell, yeah. Tell stories at different lengths. Tell the best one minute story. Tell the best five minute story, and um, that's what we're doing. We're, we're doing stuff on all these different mediums and just having a lot of fun. Now, um, I'm going to ask you a few questions. To ask all my guests, what advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today? Make it actually make it don't talk about it make it go outside and shoot it and if it's not great make it a little bit better next time but uh don't just develop forever don't just put it on paper go and make it you can actually make stuff now do it yourself what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn whether in the film industry or in life 90 percent perfect is good enough you know <laughs> like <laughs> uh, don't don't like us otherwise you'll be just paralyzed and you'll never put stuff out you know, um, delegation, right. You know, like don't, you don't need, you can't do everything. If you're really going to go and have influence and make a lot of stuff at once, you got to build a great team. But, you know, I think it's, it's, it's letting go, um, and, and putting stuff out to the world and, and, and not, um, caving into that fear that start, it's not there yet. It's not there yet. You know, you gotta, you gotta rele release it eventually. And last question, uh, three of your favorite films of all time. I think I gave you three already, which, which are, um, Happy Gilmore, Billy Madison, super bad. I can add. <laughs> I love. I love. We yeah. We covered that. We started it. Um, I I. Uh, I mean, I love Charlie Chaplin movies. That was oh, I yeah. love Chaplin films. Yeah. Gold Rush. I, I watched, yeah. watched, oh yeah. Oh yeah. The kid. Even yeah. films. Yeah. Even films like Limelight. I know that gets like. Mm -hmm. I like. I, I really love Chaplin. I. I and I, and you know he made short films and silent films and did talkies. Um, so I'll add Chaplin into the mix. Oh, can you imagine if Chaplin was around today? Like what he would be doing? Oh God, different kind having of having a lot of having a lot of fun. I always like imagine Kubrick with today's technology. Oh my right. God, right. talk about shooting! He'd shoot forever <laughs> before he had the limitations of film. Can you imagine? You just shoot yeah. and shoot, uh, Michael. Man, it's been a pleasure talking to you, brother. Thank you again so much for being on the show, man, and continued success. Thank you for having me. Fun.